All right. Hello. That's good. Sounds good. And how about me? How are my levels? Are you they sound, okay? You sound great. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Welcome to Why Not Change the World, the RPI podcast. I'm Reeve Hamilton. On this episode, we're talking about humanity and technology and the future of both. I'm joined by Peter Nowak, award-winning journalist and best-selling author of Humans 3.0, The Upgrading of the Species. Hi, Reeve. And Susan Smith, lecturer in the Cognitive Science Department here at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Good afternoon. Peter, let's start by talking about your book, Humans 3.0. Um, I would describe it as a look at our technologically enhanced future that is both clear-eyed and upbeat. Is that a a fair description, do you think? Yeah, I think so. It's been described as an optimistic book. Uh, I can't remember who one of the reviewers said it was uh, a tonic for the the doom and gloom out there. Um, I think that's probably a pretty accurate description. Um, And it's not just, you know, I don't don't like to think of it as sort of like a pie in the sky thing. Uh, You know, I kind of looked at uh, I came to this conclusion from looking at data. Um, you know, there's the sort of thing that we call data journalism. And I, I think when I started working on this book, I didn't even know what data journalism was at the, at the time. But that's what I was trying to do is I was trying to look at the data that I that we've had compiled over centuries across various aspects of what it means to be human and come to some sort of conclusion. And uh, I guess that's the conclusion I came to, which is that uh, we're, we are generally upgrading as a species. Are people surprised when you tell them this? or it's, Were you surprised? Oh, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, it's the book was published in 2015, and so we've had a couple of years since then. And even just on my own, there have been times where I've wanted to just throw my book in the garbage and burn <laughs> it because you look at world events and you think, oh, man, <laughs> how are we possibly evolving or getting better? Uh, but again, it's, it is, I think it's, if you try to take a big picture look and try to step back from the day to day and the day to, daily news cycle, um, that's when you look at that data, I think that's the direction that it is indeed pointing in, despite how it may seem. And Susan, this book was chosen as this year's community read selection here at Rensselaer, uh, which I think you had some involvement in. Can you tell us what that means and, and why this book was a good fit? Certainly. Uh, The community read is meant to create an experience for our incoming uh, students to uh, bond in a particular way over a topic. And and there are lots of ways that they do this in the community way. Community read is one of the ways that we try and do that. The theme typically, or the theme is drawn from Dr. Jackson's theme of exploration for the year. So in the spring, she announced... uh, the theme of health of the planet, leadership for local care and global impact. So we we took that into consideration. It's also, we also wanted to choose a book that resonated with the Haas inquiry courses that faculty in Haas have created. And Haas uh, is the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. Yes, correct. One of our RPI uh, acronyms. (laughs) So uh, the Haas inquiry courses have been developed uh, as part of this new curriculum to expose students to big questions and to look at those questions and explore them through multidisciplinary perspectives, uh, keeping in mind you know, our ethical, legal, and social imp- obligations. Uh, so this book, because those courses cover such a range of topics, uh, this book fit really well for us uh, because it does touch on all the different ways that we live as human beings and the different things that affect our lives. So, for example, uh, Brom Van Hoovelen from Cognitive Science teaches a course called Minds and Machines. And so they've been looking at that bo- book within the context of that particular class. Uh, Selmer Brings Yours, Are Humans Rational? has been using the book. Uh, my my particular class, Genome and You, is using the book right now. And I know my students are anxious to talk to Peter about their questions with respect to health and welfare and genetic sequencing. And do you have a sense of what their questions might be? <laughs> uh, Not to speak for your students, of course. No, no. Several of the students are very interested um, in asking about the future and whether you know, we are going to have this singularity event. So that's something definitely all of our students are interested in. What I really liked about this book and what I think they picked up on was the idea of creativity 
um, creativity and science, creativity and innovation, um, the fact that you know, n new ideas are typically built upon old ones, and I think they see that as inspiration for what they can do in the future. Especially the one, ch the chapter that looked at, you know, all the startup tech companies. Uh, the fact that they can actually build on their ideas, and it's, you know, we have brilliant students here, so um, I think they found it inspirational. In terms of questions, uh, I think that, that they picked up on the optimistic tone of the book, and it was hard to convince them of that. Hmm. And they, I, they honestly really questioned a lot of the data, and they, they looked into that, and, and it, it all matched up. And so uh, they were left uh, wondering why they had this predisposition to think things were, were going to go negatively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well... I want to ask you about that, Peter, but first, can you explain uh, what the singularity event is? Oh, sure. Um, well, I think probably that's attached mostly to uh, Ray Kurzweil and um, some people that think in those same veins. Ray, Ray Kurzweil is, of course, an inventor and a futurist. He's written numerous books. Uh, probably the most germane to this topic is The Singularity is Near, which I think was 1999. Uh, essentially, what the argument is, is uh, it goes into Moore's Law, and I ho hopefully most listeners are familiar with Moore's Law. That's basically the principle that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles uh, just about every year. Essentially, it means that computers are getting better and faster at an exponential rate. And uh, so the so what, what Kurzweil, I believe he calls it the law of accelerating returns, talks about is that computer, the computer processing power will continue to grow exponentially. It's continuing to grow exponentially. And I think he figures by something like 2040, which is only about 20, 20 short years away, is that it will surpass the computational power of the human brain. And once that happens, of course, we're just talking about raw computation here, but it's going to take a little while longer for computers to be able to match, uh, I guess, sort of like the wisdom part of the human brain. But ultimately, that's going to allow us to map the human brain. And from there is we're, we're going to be able to copy the human brain and therefore copy our, our uh, essentially clone ourselves. Uh, that's getting a little bit into the science fiction part of it. But Essentially, the singularity is what happens when computing processing power uh, um, uh, surpasses human the human ability to think. Uh, that's going to be a situation where it is the singularity beyond which it's difficult to imagine what is going to happen. Now, it sounds crazy and, and futuristic, but, you know, we've had numerous singularities before. Uh, the invention of the printing press, I think, was one, which is it, it's impossible to imagine what life was like before the printing press for you or I or anybody else. And it, it would similarly be impossible for somebody living at that time to imagine what the world would be like once after the printing press was invented, which of course it was dramatically different. So that's in a nutshell, I think, of what the, the theory is. And do you have a sense of why people like, well, like myself or like maybe students in Susan's class, sort of when they hear about this future, they start to think about it, they inherently maybe come to it sort of with a negative view. I got the sense that maybe when you started your previous book, um, Sex, Bombs, and Burgers, mm -hmm. uh, that you had even sort of not necessarily, you didn't have the same perspective that you do now. Uh, why do you think it is that people sort of naturally recoil at the technological overlords of our future? I have to say, I think it's largely cultural. Um, there was a very, there's a, a sort of almost like a knee jerk negative reaction towards uh, just robots, for example, and artificial intelligence in Western culture, but you don't necessarily find the same in Eastern culture. In Japan, robots are thought of as benevolent uh, and AI is generally thought of some, as something that's benevolent and, and same goes for South Korea. Um, it's, I think it's a lot to do, I, I, unfortunately, I think it has to do a lot with pop culture. Uh, you know, the Terminator, for example, as soon as you start talking about robots, immediately somebody starts talking about the Terminator. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of how we've, our, our culture has been affected by uh, pop culture and also by news media, I think. And then by extension, social media, uh, is not necessarily universally the case in the world. Well, now, how do you find that uh, the students that you mentioned, Susan, that have sort of looked into the data and double-checked it, um, 
do you find them interacting with the other subject matter in your course differently? Or I mean, how does how does engaging with this book in the community read context uh, sort of change your courses overall? Uh, well, the verdict's still out because we just finished uh, with the book, so we're just proceeding with the rest of the course. But I think it's going to enhance the way that we look at material. So I ask the students, especially in the genomics class, uh, to really think about the impact of, of the decisions that we make. And uh, after reading the book and, and seeing you know, all of these unintended consequences and understanding that when we have new technology, there will be unintended consequences, that we do need to stop and, and take a minute and ask ourselves, like, how fast should we proceed? Because a lot of our students are like, you know, if we have the ability, we should do it, right? We should keep going. And especially within uh, genetic testing and s genome sequencing, there, there are still a lot of questions that need to be answered, not just about, you know, is this going to be harmful to a person, but what's this going to do for our population? And what kind of responsibility do we have for future generations. So I'm hoping it will enhance that understanding because it's very hard to picture these things. Uh, I, I always show Gattaca at the end of our genome course, and most of the students have already seen it. But after talking through all of those issues and then ending with that, it really, they watch it in a very different way. So I've seen how uh, different types of media can impact the way that, that they're understanding the information. I think this book and, and seeing the data behind the claims, um, I think that's going to allow them to be a little more open-minded and maybe a little more aggressive in terms of imagining what's going to happen if we do this, mm -hmm. you know. And there is at least one RPI alumni name-checked in the book, Steve Sasson. Mm -hmm. So they have someone to look up to. But it's sort of like <laughs> you, you allude to, um, it's not all roses, right? I mean, there are definitely some unintended consequences that you delve into in this book. I mean, what are some of the lingering uh, things that sort of keep you up at night when you think about uh, advances in technology and how society is handling them? Oh, yeah. Well, there's um, a bunch of them. And some of them are quite big. Of course, the probably the, the, the biggest one and the most worrisome is climate change. Um, you know, Humans 3.0, the actual title uh, references a lot of uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, us being in the what anthropologists call the Anthropocene era, which is uh, an epoch of human evolution where we have now actually uh, are starting con to control nature, both the environment and our biology. And that's leading to a lot of great positive things like living longer and living better and so on. But it's also resulting in a lot of bad side effects. Uh, climate change is, of course, the biggest. And, you know, just this morning I was watching um, Greta, I think her name is Greta Thunberg. I right. think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, you know, she that's was giving, as close as we're going to get. Yeah, exactly. I'm not <laughs> Swedish, so I don't know. But she was giving, you know, a speech at the climate summit. And, uh, and this is the 16 year old yeah. uh, climate change activist. Right. The one who basically sparked uh, the, the worldwide protests uh, just recently. And and, uh, you know, she's uh, she's right on the money. She's very uh, right about everything she's talking about. She's very angry about it. Uh, so that's a that's one of the huge side effects we have of all of our technological pro uh, progress. And it's not a technological or even smarts issue. It's a it's completely a political issue. So that's something that needs to be solved uh, post haste. Uh, and that's just one of the issues. I think one of the other almost sort of short ter shorter term problems is inequality. Um, the the positive effect that we're seeing of technological uh, development and prosperity is growing prosperity in the world. You're seeing a lot of uh, previously poor countries coming up in the world. So many people are being elevated out of extreme poverty. That's one of the great news stories in the world that you almost never hear about. So I think hopefully that's one of the things that your students have looked up, Susan, that yeah. they, uh, they've looked it up and said, wow, that's actually true. It's mm -hmm. actually happening. Um, so that's great. But the side effect of that is that also, sure, a lot of people are coming out of poverty, but also a lot of that economic growth is also uh, uh, s such a big chunk of it is going into the pockets of very few people, which, of course, is where the inequality comes in. And inequality is... I think aside from climate change, the biggest problem in the world today, because it's leads to a lot of problems like social unrest 
and uh, lack of trust or, or loss of faith in governments and institutions, even loss of faith in science. Uh, all of these things are, are signs of inequality and instability follows, violence follows, and that's the problem. And hopefully the good news is, is that we've gone through this kind of stuff before and with luck we've learned some of those lessons and hopefully we'll get through it again. And of course the tough thing with, with an issue like inequality or climate change is how can one person solve it, right? I mean, or is there a technological solution to, to something like inequality? Um, I mean, who's, whose responsibility is it or, or who, should be, who should we look to to make sure that these things uh, are not just left to fester as we move forward? Mm-hmm. I think a, a lot of it is related to how we're bringing up our youth right now. And I don't know that as a young person, things like inequality were st- – No one really talked about it in our schools. Um, I grew up in Canada, and I don't. the The wealth discrepancies weren't as obvious to me. Maybe I was just sheltered. I don't know. But I think that our young people are much more aware of what's going on, and I don't think they're they're hopefully. I think that's who we have to look to. I hope that they're not going to be lulled into you know business as usual, and this. The idea that that so many people are being lifted out of poverty is is uh, it's it's amazing, right? But that shouldn't stop us from you know asking where the rest of this money is going. and And I think that happens. Complacency happens sometimes when we're satisfied with a, a bit, and and we need to push past our past our comfort zones. And hopefully, our younger generation is willing to do that for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I agree with that. Um, I think in a in what we hope is a democratic society, the who is responsible for solving these problems is the people, and you do that by uh, and that's exactly it. Is when things are relatively good, well, you let things slide. When things are not as good, that's when the people get angry and start to stand up and demand change. And uh, are we in? That, are we at that phase? I kind of think we are. So uh, it's it's easy to look at. You know, people being angry and thinking, oh, this is bad. We're in like the darkest timeline here. But I think that's a precursor to things getting better. So that's kind of the optimistic way of looking at it. And well, and, and in the book you mentioned, you know, you, society has gotten to points before where either there's a revolution or there are reforms. And sort of at some point, I guess people have to make that decision. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you mentioned the statistics on global poverty levels and how extreme poverty has fallen around the world. In addition to those stats, were there any other findings in the course of reporting this book that surprised you or that you weren't expecting? Um, The thing that jumps out at me at the top of my head right now is probably privacy. Um, It's funny because privacy has kind of almost taken a back burner over the last couple of years. Maybe not. Maybe I just haven't been paying as much attention to it. But when I was working on the book, privacy was a huge issue. Um, You know, there was this assumption that people didn't care about privacy anymore. And I think uh, some of the executives of the big companies said as much. And uh, in looking into that, I found, no, actually, people, especially young people, care about very much about privacy. It's just in ways that you don't expect. Uh, One of the examples I think I gave in the book was, uh, this was, again, research done in, actually, a lot of that chapter that has to do with privacy, um, it it takes place in Canada, uh, which is where Susan and I are both from. And for some reason, Canada is one of these uh, countries that really, really values its privacy. Uh, And there was a a research study done there where uh, kids were told, or I shouldn't say kids, but students, I think they were university students, were told about their private messaging uh, apps. And they said, well, you know that they were told that, you know that the companies that make those apps essentially own your conversations. And uh, the, the students said, well, that's fine. We don't care because they can look at our, our messages. We're not concerned about that. We're concerned about keeping uh, keeping our messages private from our parents. And uh, text messaging our friends is way better than talking to them on the phone because our parents can listen to us while we're talking on the phone. They can't necessarily see our text messages. So they have a very, I think it was what that study was essentially proving is that they have a high value on privacy. It's just not the in the same places that we older generations thought they should be. 
We actually, last year's community read was Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, and it talked a lot about data privacy. And I, I agree, I don't think our students were really concerned with the information that they're putting out on the web. But after reading that book, I th a lot of them really changed their minds to see that this information is being used in these complex algorithms to make decisions about things like how much you're going to pay for your car insurance or whether you're going to get health insurance or not. Uh, and I think it really opened the, the door for them in terms of understanding that we need to have some kind of control over how this information is being used. And right about the same time, all of the, the GDPR came out right, in Europe about like the enhanced laws for protecting data privacy. And it just became so obvious that that's something our young people hadn't really thought, thought about, at least the students that I was working with at the time. And mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was pretty shocking to them. Well, and that gets to the issue of social media, which also has some, I think, unintended consequences for people, right, in terms of how they actually relate to each other in reality and in person, which you mm -hmm. discuss a bit mm -hmm. in the book. It's hard to disengage from because a lot of people feel like they have to be on social media, but it, maybe we don't quite have the education on how to use these things mm -hmm. appropriately. I mean, how, how can we turn back the clock on some of these things if they are increasingly of concern? I think it's, uh, to borrow a business term, I think there's a bit of a market correction going on uh, naturally, So I th and I think that's good news. Um, you're, I was looking at this the other day that Twitter, uh, both Twitter and Facebook are continually having uh, lower usage. They're continue, the usage is continuing to go down. In fact, Twitter earlier this year said that they were going to stop reporting how many users they were losing, which you know it's bad when a company <laughs> <laughs> refuses to give up certain information. They become and, less transparent. Exactly. Uh, and I, I think that's actually a good thing. I think it's a reflection of... Uh, people are recognizing that you can't have proper conversations in in, in these media and uh, can, because they inevitably become cesspools. And so they stay away. I think we have a natural uh, inclination to stay away from that sort of thing. So in a way, like I said, it's it's kind of self self-correcting. But as you said, uh, this is something that's kind of new and we, we haven't developed the ability to, um, in the talk that I'm giving, I give an image of a fire hose, of drinking from a fire hose. And that's all of this information is like a, a fire hose that we've, we've been drinking from for years now. And we hadn't really had the capacity to, I mean, I don't know if you know how to drink from a fire hose. I, su I sure don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I haven't but, tried. I, and no, I think I we're, we're slowly but surely starting to realize, hey, maybe it's not a good idea to try. So <laughs> <laughs> another thing I'm interested in, just since, as you mentioned, as Humans 3.0 came out in 2015. Uh, now you're at work on another project, your forthcoming book, The Rise of Real Life Superheroes and the Fall of Everything Else. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? And how does the ideas how do the ideas behind Humans 3.0 lead to to this new project? Yeah, it's interesting because it seems like a total digression. Uh, first of all, the book is essentially about um, real life superheroes, which is exactly what it sounds like. These are peop men and women who dress up, real men and women who dress up in costumes and go out and fight crime. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they go out and they try to help homeless people as well. Uh, that's not a technology book, uh, which is, you know, my first two were. Uh, yeah, so it is admittedly a digression. Um, but um, I've, in the book, you know, I basically hung out with a lot of these people over the course of two years. And I went on patrol with them and I talked about them. And I learned a lot about why why are they doing what they're doing? Why are their numbers multiplying? There's hundreds of them, if not thousands. Uh, and what does it say about people? So, you know, Humans 3.0, I think, skewed more towards what's what's right with people, what's good about people. And this one, I think, is it touches on that too because these people are trying to be good. They're trying to capture the essence of what it means to be a superhero. But I think it's also about you know, what's wrong with people, uh, what's wrong with the rest of us that this is kind of necessary for, uh, th that this is happening. So in a way, I'm looking at, you know, the, the sort of the forces of what, what dictates the world or what has made the world the way it is and what's, how it's changing us. And in that sense, I think all three of my books have kind of been in the same vein, which is looking at those forces that are uh, uh, changing us and how they define us. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. In the meantime, Peter, Susan, that's all the time we have. And thank you both for being here with us today. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Why Not Change the World is recorded in the Soloist Suite at MPAC, the Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Thank you to the MPAC staff for their assistance, and thank you for listening.